Today we're going to be speaking on the Justinian Plague, one of the most apocalyptic events in human history. This is going to be a series of unfolding tragedies, of chaos that has no limits. This is going to be a disaster unlike many of you have probably heard of before. Um, this, this is definitely going to be one of the largest mass killing events in human history, and it's probably only going to be beaten out in this by the Black Death. The Justinian Plague is going to kill probably between 40 and 50 percent of the population of Europe. This is going to begin in the late 530s AD and continue and continue and continue. Basically, Europe has been turned to hell on Earth. To give you the backstory of what's, paint a better picture of what's happening here in, in Byzantium. In the 530s, Justinian the Great is going to be hellbent on recapturing the Western Roman Empire. He is possessed by the ancient spirit of that lost Roman glory. And he will sacrifice everything for that glory. He just raids the treasury. He spends everything he's got on erecting massive monuments and statues and building new churches and temples everywhere. He's going to spend everything that Byzantine, the, the Byzantines have on procuring more and more and more soldiers. And he's going to succeed, too. He's going to bust in there into Rome and retake it in 538 AD. But at what cost? Well, the price of his glory was a citizenry that was destitute. They had been literally taxed to death to afford this campaign. People are starving in mass. People are dying in mass of starvation. This is the scene I am setting and what happened before we even really began with something that truly could only have come from an apocalypse. The impoverishment of the people of the Byzantine Empire was unfortunately only the beginning of the horrors that are going to befall Europe and the rest of the world. For a sign is going to appear in the sky that would be the harbinger of the coming apocalypse. In Galicia, which is a province in northwest Spain, there are ceaseless earthquakes. Many signs are seen in the sky. For not the day before on the 3rd of April, after sunset, from the north, a stroke of blinding red, as if fire or blood is produced. This is interspersed by the fiery redness with brighter lines, deformed into the appearance of descending spears. A comet is hurtling towards the earth. This is actually Halley's Comet, um, which would have been making its return around the Earth in 530 AD, somewhere in there, 530s AD. Now, extraterrestrial material has been found in the Greenland ice dated to around this time. So that indicates part of the comet is going to actually fragment away and strike the Earth somewhere in the north. The analysis of the tree rings and the Yamalta Peninsula um, confirm that the period suffered from an extreme climate change. What followed is actually the most significant cooling event in, in the last 2,000 years of human history. Accompanied by this striking of the comet, there are going to be frequent earthquakes, there are going to be volcanic eruptions uh, that is going to produce a volcanic winter and an ash cloud that is going to envelop Western Europe. There was a sign in the sun, the like of which had never been seen and reported before in the world. If we had not found it recorded in the majority of proved and credible writings and confirmed by trustworthy people, we would not have recorded it, for it is difficult to conceive. 
So it is said that the sun became dark, and its darkness lasted for one and a half years, that is, eighteen months. Each day it shone for about four hours, and still this light was only a feeble shadow. Everyone declared that the sun would never recover its original light. The fruits did not ripen, and the wine tasted like sour grapes. The heavenly calamity produced a world without sun, and thus a world without harvest, and one without food. So the already starving people in Byzantium and this Byzantine Empire, <laughs> it's going to get so much worse for them. The, the, the starving people, right, it, all this starvation already taking place in Europe is going to reach just unparalleled heights at this point because the crops are just refusing to grow because the sun will not give its light. Here it is written, The sun, first of stars, seems to have lost its wonted light and appears of a bluish color. We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, to feel the mighty vigor of its heat wasted into feebleness, and the phenomena which accompany a transitory eclipse prolonged through a whole year. We've had a winter without storms, a spring without mildness, and a summer without heat. Whence can we look for harvest since the months which should have been maturing the corn have been chilled by Bore Boreas? How can the blade open if rain, the mother of all fertility, is denied to it? These two influences prolong frost and unseasonable drought, must be adverse to all things that grow. The seasons seem to have jumbled all together, and the fruits which were wont to be formed by gentle showers cannot be looked for from the parched earth. Right, so they're they're getting <laughs> there's a drought going on as well. This destitution and ensuing starvation for the inability to grow crops had reached such dire straits that the Bishop of Milan uh, made the following report. At that time there was a heavy famine throughout the whole world. As Dadius, bishop of the city Milan, has related fully in his report, so that in Liguria, women eat their own children for hunger and want. Some of them, he has said, were of the family of his own church. Europe had become a starving land and shrouded in darkness that lasted for a full 18 months, and from that darkness another horseman of an apocalypse sprung forth. The Black Death. The plague, which is the rising of a swelling on the groins and in the armpits of men, began in Egypt and Ethiopia and Alexandria and Nubia and Palestine and Phoenicia and Arabia and Byzantium and Italy and Africa and Sicily and Gaul. And it penetrated to Galatia and Cappadocia and Armenia and Antioch and Mesopotamia and gradually to the land of the Persians and it slew. And those who were afflicted with the scourge and happened to recover and not die trembled and shook, and it was known that it was a scourge from Satan who was ordered by God to destroy men. Medically known as Yersinia pestis, but commonly known as the plague, or the Black Death, is the most prolific illness in human history. The Justinian Plague and the later medieval Black Death um, are, were extinct forms of the Yersinia pestis virus, or bacterium, actually, um, that we know of today as bubonic plague. These are uh, the Black Death and uh, the Justinian Plague are extinct uh, mutations of, of Yersinia pestis. Thank God. Both of these strains would originate in China and uh, be spread to Europe, Africa, and Middle East via the Silk Road. The plague would come in three forms, S sort of unholy trinity. If breathed in through the air, it would become pneumonic plague. It would affect the lungs and revolt, result in bloody discharge from the mouth and the nose. This had a 100% mortality rate. 
even today, I forget the exact number, but the mortality rate is extremely high, over 60%, I believe. If the disease was contracted via an infected flea bite, it would cause bubonic plague, which would result in necrosis or rotting of the skin and accompanied by buboes or swollen lymph nodes that would burst into a bloody discharge. Gangrene, or the blackened rotting of flesh, would occur in the fingers, the arms, the feet, the lips, the nose, even sometimes around the eyes, and the toes. The plague could also develop into septicemic plague from an infection of plague into the bloodstream. This will result in bleeding beneath the skin, rotting of flesh, vomiting of blood, and the profusion of blood from every bodily cavity. So the eyes, blood coming from the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, just fucking everywhere. This trinity of death had no recourse, no salvation, no cure. Uh, without modern science, Again, the phenomic and the septicemic plague had a mortality of 100%. Only the bubonic form with a 60% mortality rate offered any hope. This horror brought another unfortunate symptom. Hallucinations. These visions of the damned caused people to see and hear things that were not truly there. Now, all these people with the Black Death, the plague, all these infected, basically half the populace, um, many of which are going to be, many of those people are going to be suffering from hallucinations. And due to the state of their misery, the hallucinations were often more of a living nightmare. Procopius informed us that in a sizable minority of patients, hallucinations were indeed present. Apparitions of supernatural beings in human guise of every description were seen by many persons, and those who encountered them thought that they were struck by the man they had met in this or that part of the body as it happened, and immediately upon seeing this apparition, they were seized also by the disease. So they believe there's a man going around um, infecting people, a dark figure. Now at first, those who met these creatures tried to turn them aside by the uttering the holiest of names and exercising them in other ways as well as each one could. So they're, they're attempting to exercise these things that only they can see. But they accomplished absolutely nothing for even in the sanctuaries where most of them fled for refuge, they were constantly dying. But later on, they were unwilling even to give heed to their friends when they called upon them, and they shut themselves up in their rooms and pretended they did not hear, although their doors were being bitten down, fearing, obviously, that he who was calling was one of those demons. All right, so they... Yeah, it, basically it was causing a loss of... People had lost their mind from the illness, and um, they believe that people they're seeing are demonic and they're after them. But in the case of some of the pestilence, did not come on in this way. But they saw a vision in a dream, and seemed to suffer the very same thing at the hands of the creature who stood over them, or else to hear a voice foretelling to them that they were written down in the number of those who were to die. So the hallucinogenic effect of this illness is causing it to be significantly more nightmarish than even it already was. So it is going to be with demons and devils that the Black Death is going to swarm itself through the streets of Europe. The belief that the devil and that the demons were disseminating the plague made this event even more apocalyptic. The primary belief was that the, the wrath of God was upon them, and their own sins the reason for this catastrophe. The other very popular competing opinion was that the devil had come, aided by demons to spread the plague. 
Often the devil is believed to have been set loose upon the people by God as a punishment for their sins. Now importantly, in the Bible, Lucifer is cast out of heaven and descends to the earth. And the devil, for this reason, gains the nickname the Morning Star because of this. Indeed, it was a star or a comet descending to the earth and striking it that precedes the plague and gives rationale, certainly, to this line of thinking. Now, religious explanation and devotion is not going to negatively affect the situation, right? For, because it's, we have there's an extreme lack of medical knowledge, right? Nothing can be done. So... Um, no effective recourse can be had. This, however, did not mean that misinformation or disinformation and it's, um, is not going to have a terrible cause. It was, in fact, rampant. Due to the religious nature in this society, it is not unsurprising that it is Lucifer, the prince of lies, and the demonic that we can see disinformation being attributed to. Again, it was told that at that time in another city on the border of Palestine, demons appeared to its inhabitants in the shape of angels. They deceived them, saying that they should make haste to worship an idol of bronze, which had been left like other bronze statues which now stand in cities. Previously, it had been one of the idols of the pagans, and also it had a name, and it was even now secretly worshipped by those who were caught up in the paganism. Thus the demons made the entire city worship the idol, saying, If you first worship such and such idol, death will not enter the city. This did not end well. The demons, of course, right, they lied, you know, um, and so... Um, these disinformers who were telling the people this and trying to start their own cult or bring back some archaic paganism um, did not protect the people. And they were subsequently ravaged by plague. Desperate for salvation, disinformation would continue. And it would be blamed often on demons. The latter happened in this city. The demons wanted to lead people astray and to laugh at their madness. A rumor from somebody spread among those who had survived that if they threw pitchers from windows of their upper stories onto the streets and they burst below, death would flee from the city. When foolish women out of their minds succumbed to this folly in one neighborhood and threw pitchers out, the rumor spread to this city quarter to another and over the whole city and everybody succumbed to this foolishness, so that for three days people could not show themselves on the streets, since those who had escaped death were assiduously occupied alone or in groups and in their houses with chasing away death by breaking pitchers. All right, so people are desperate to believe anything to get rid of this, to save themselves and their family and everyone around them. This uh, miracle cure of breaking pitchers did not work, right? There is going to be a false prophet that arises in these times. One who would claim to be Jesus Christ and peddle false cures in his name. These are the beginnings of the sorrows according to what the Lord says in the gospel. There shall be pestilence, and famines, and earthquakes, in different places. And false Christs and false prophets shall arise, and give signs and prodigies in the heavens, so as to put the elect astray, as it is true at the present time. For a certain man of Borges, as he himself told later, went into the deep woods to cut logs, which he needed for a certain work, and a swarm of flies surrounded him, as a result of which he was considered crazy for two years, whence it may be believed that they were a wickedness sent by the devil. So this man, this woodcutter, has become possessed. Then he passed through the neighboring cities and went to the province of Ares, where, and there he wore animal skins and prayed like one of the devout, and to make a fool of him, the enemy gave him the power of divination. 
the enemy being the devil. After this, he rose from this place and left the province mentioned in order to become more expert in wickedness and entered into the territory of Gebedun, constructing himself as a great man and not afraid to say that he was, in fact, Christ. He took with him a woman who passed as his sister to whom he gave the name Mary. A multitude of people flocked to him, bringing the sick whom he touched and supposedly restored to health. They who came to him brought him also gold and silver and other garments. These he distributed among the poor to deceive them the more easily. And throwing himself on the ground and praying with the woman I have mentioned in rising, he would give orders to the bystanders to worship him in turn. He foretold the future and announced that disease would come to some, to others losses, and to others health. But all this he did by some arts and trickeries of the devil. A great multitude of people were led astray by him, not only the common folk, but bishops of the church. More than 3,000 people followed him. Now once assembling an army, <laughs> this Antichrist began to escalate to even greater criminal activity. He began to spoil and plunder those whom he met on the road, the booty, however, he gave to those who had nothing. Sounds like Robin Hood, right? He threatened with death bishops and citizens because they disdained to worship him. He entered La Vallée and went to the place called Poi and halted with all his host at the churches near there, marshalling his line of battle to make war on Aurelius, who was then bishop, and sending messengers forward naked men who danced and played and announced his coming. The bishop was amazed at this and sent strong men to ask what the, his doings meant. One of these, the leader, bent down as if to embrace him. But the other at once drew his sword and cut him to bits, and that Christ, who ought rather to be named Antichrist, fell dead, and all who were with him dispersed. Mary was tortured and revealed all his impostures and deceits. But the men whom he had excited to a belief in him by the trickery of the devil never returned to their sound senses. But they always said that this man was indeed Christ in a sense and that Mary had a share in his divine nature. So this false prophet, right, conjured up thousands of people and attempted to lead them into war on the bishops of the church and ultimately failed in doing so and led, ultimately led thousands to their deaths. The robbing of the highways, his military attempt to overthrow the bishop failed. The false prophet had fallen in combat and his burgeoning cult would forever remain detached from reality. The fake Jesus Christ is not the only one stirring up trouble <laughs> during these times. Um, there are many looters, many pillagers trying to take advantage of this. Um, half the people are dead. House robbing is a thing. Uh, and they were wanting to get rich off of it in any way they could. Or honestly, in a lot of ways, just find food to eat. Um, because, again, they're starving. A parable by Joshua the Stylite encapsulates this epidemic of looting. They dared to enter the homes, which were rich and empty of inhabitants. For three days they gathered only gold and silver and filled one large house. On the third day, when they were carrying the loot and entering the house, there inside the house, God's wrath became upon them. Immediately they fell, and all of them except that little boy within one hour perished on top of the loot they had gathered. Well, this is both a parable and a reality. If you're going, the Black Death is there. Um, if you're going into the house of people who have died of the Black Death, it's unlikely you're getting out of it without being infected, um, especially with touching all their stuff and stealing it. So um, this is both a warning that's true against looting, um, but also something that the fact that this was written um, 
shows that there was a lot of probably a lot of looting during that time. If you have to create a religious parable about something, uh, chances are um, it's happening in an abundance. The Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora are uh, not spared from rumor nor blame. Justinian had ordered the slaughter of 35,000 civilians earlier in the Nika riots. He had destroyed the economy, caused rampant starvation. Justinian was guilty of a lot of things. And to many, he was the cause of the plague as well. It was rumored that Justinian and his wife Theodora were in fact man-demons, or bloodthirsty demons, intent on the destruction of the human race. It was said that his mother had been raped by an incubus demon, and from this unholy desecration, Justinian was born. Another rumor was that Justinian was in fact possessed, and that witnesses had oddly seen his head disappear on multiple occasions from his body and then return back to its proper place. Odd. For Theodora's part, she was rumored to have been trained by witches from an early age and was herself a practitioner of the dark arts. It was not unusual for a leader to be blamed for a plague, especially one who slaughtered many of his own people and left them starving. Makes sense for him to be a target of this. Paul the Deacon reports in 590 AD. At this time, there was a deluge of water in the territories of Venetia and Liguria, and in other regions of Italy. Such as is believed not to have existed since the time of Noah. In this outpouring of the flood, the river Tiber at the city of Rome rose so much that its waters flowed in over the walls of the city and filled great regions of it. Then, through the bed of the same stream, a great multitude of serpents and a dragon, also of astonishing size, passed by the city and descended to the sea. Straight away, a very grievous pestilence called Enguinal followed this inundation, and it wasted the people with such great destruction of life out of a countless multitude, barely a few survived. First, it struck Pope Pelagius, a venerable man, and killed him quickly. Then when their pastor was taken away, it spread among the people. The plague's effect, however, on rumor, on disinformation, on societal chaos, paled in comparison to the decimation it wrought on the economy. Joshua the Stylite gives us an idea of the degree of death occurring. He would have to weep and lament over the whole earth upon which the command went out like a reaper and mowed and laid down innumerable people of all ages, all sizes, and all ranks all together, right? So this idea of death's personification linked to a reaping or a harvest, right? Um, in this sense, the collection of souls, harvest of souls um, is, is present even here in the Justinian plague. Over houses, large and small, beautiful and desirable, which suddenly became tombs for their inhabitants and in which servants and masters at the same time suddenly fell dead, mingling their rottenness together in their bedrooms, and not one of them escaped who might remove their corpses out from within the house. Over ships in the midst of the sea, whose sailors were suddenly attacked by God's wrath, and the ships became tombs for their captains, and they continued to adrift on the waves, carrying the corpses of their owners. Thus, over these things, the prophet might weep and say, Woe upon me not because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, but because of the desolation of the entire habitable earth of humanity, which has been corrupted by its sins, and because the world in its entirety has already been made desolate for some time and has become empty of its inhabitants. All of this death is going to have severe consequences, right, for the society, for the economy. Um, the Roman army itself, right, where the Byzantine army itself is going to be reduced in size considerably. Uh, 
it's noted here, Agathius says that where the army should have been a force of 645,000 men, the number had dropped to barely 150,000 men. All right. This reduction in the armed forces, which is about a 77% reduction right in the size of the military, is going to allow the Huns to come in and pillage Constantinople. Right? The military is still going to repulse the invasion. Right? They're going to keep them out, but it does allow Constantinople to get pillaged by the Huns. Justinian is not going to have much pity on people all right, as, as they're dying and, um, and all this death occurring to his own citizenry. He is going to allow attacks to exist that um, is basically going to say, if your neighbor dies, uh, you have to pay their taxes now, right? The taxes still have to get paid. If your son dies, you have to pay his taxes now. If your neighbor dies, you have to pay their taxes, right? And this law wouldn't get repealed till 544 AD, years into this crisis. So um, just making people even more financially destitute. Paul the deacon describes the the economic matters in the countryside here. You might see the world brought back to its ancient silence. No voice in the field, no whistling of shepherds, no lying in wait of wild beasts among the cattle, no harm to domestic fowls. The crops, outliving the time of the harvest, awaited the reaper untouched. The vineyard, with its fallen leaves and its shining grapes, remained undisturbed while winter came on. Pastoral places have been turned into sepulchres of men, and human habitations have become places of refuge for wild beasts. All right, so in the countryside, it's returned to nature, more or less, due to the death of men. In here in Constantinople, the description is pretty shocking. Buying and selling ceased, and the shops with all their worldly riches beyond description and money lenders' large shops closed. The entire city then came to a standstill as if it had perished so that its food supply stopped. There was nobody to stand and do his job, with the result that food vanished from the markets and great tribulation ensued. Only a few were strong enough to bring any to the bazaar, anything worth one obel, but if they wished, they could take a dinar for it. Thus everything ceased and stopped, right? So there's nobody left to do their jobs. All the shops have closed. All the banks have closed. The money lenders are shut down. They're not going to lend money to anybody anymore. Um, and the few people that are still alive, right, to bring food to, to the city, um, they're able to charge outrageous prices. Um, for their their bread. Indeed, in a city which was simply abounding in all good things, starvation almost absolute was running riot. Certainly it seemed a difficult and very notable thing to have a sufficiency of bread or of anything else, so that with some of the sick it appeared that the end of life came about sooner than it should have come by reason of the lack of the necessities of life. Right, so people are starving to death because all the farmers are dead, there's nobody to gather the crops, there's nobody to bring in food, um, and people are dying via starvation because of it as well. The number of dead in the city is going to reach such an extent that at one point there are over 70,000 unburied corpses lying there in the streets of the city and in homes. Justinian is going to have to pay an empire's ransom to get people to remove these corpses, right? They're terrified. They don't want to touch them, right? Because if I touch this, this infected corpse, I'm then going to have the plague and then become one myself, right? According to Dionysus of Telmarie, in some cases, the pay of a, a grave digger could reach a wage of 100 dinars, right? So this is, this is something like a grave digger, right? This is one of the lowest paid jobs in society, right? This is a super, super low paying job. Um, menial scraps. All of a sudden becomes the most important job in the entire city and in the entire empire. And people are making a um, hundred dinars a day as a daily wage. Um, it, it's just reached that level of ridiculousness. And because there's so much demand to bury the dead, uh, because there's just that many. So those who were alive, who were still left standing could charge outrageous sums of money to do anything, whether that be, yes, I will work on your farm, I will work on your crops, but you're going to have to pay me this amount 
right? And it's usually astounding, right? Because as one of the few left remaining alive, they can choose to charge whatever they'd like for their work. Eventually, Justinian is going to pass a law or an edict in 544 AD that is going to attempt to control the price gouging and the inflation escalation. We don't know that this is going to actually take effect, um, but it's, it's, it's telling and it's also way too late. It's years into this thing of the price gouging occurring. The Greenland Ice Core project we talked about in the Ananine and Cyprian Plague shows us that there was a 28% drop in um, lead emissions during the time, which would indicate a 28% drop in mining. That is less than the Antonine or the Cyprian Plague. Less of a drop in the mining activity. Some would argue that this means that, right, uh, this Justinian Plague is somehow um, less, was less catastrophic than the other two. I would argue the opposite. Um, I don't think it takes an oracle to figure out why this occurred, why there was... Um, less of a drop in mining. Justinian was hellbent on maintaining his army and on using it to uh, conquer and defend the borders and maintain what he had conquered. Justinian, it had been proven, would sacrifice it nothing for such ambitions, including the starvation of his own people. He actually left the aqueduct and Constantinople Constantinople broken for years without fixing it because he'd rather pay money to the troops to afford a larger army. He proved that he had no problem slaughtering thousands of his own civilians in an uprising. This was the kind of individual that would sacrifice it nothing for his imperial ambitions. And so the reason we see we do not see as significant of a drop in mining activity is simply because Justinian kept sending down men into those mines over and over and over again and then carrying out the bodies and then sending more in. This uh, kind of meshes with him as a person, um, but I think that's why we don't see a decrease in mining, that big of a decrease in mining activity, simply because he needed that silver in order to afford to pay his armies. And he needed that silver to keep a debasement of the currency from having to occur, which would have, again, kept him from being able to afford a large army and pay his troops, which would, of course, a rebellion potentially could have ensued. So it is my belief he's sending men down in those mines to die, to get him little specks of silver and bring it back up for his... Uh, his glory. That uh, mining drop would not return to pre-plague levels for another hundred years after the onset of the plague. The economic recovery of Byzantium, of Europe, of the Middle East, of Egypt, of Britain, of everywhere, was extremely stifled by the plague continuously returning on an average of every 11 years um, until the year 750 AD. There are even some recurrences of it um, in the early 800s AD period. But the plague, this plague had held its, its, the world in its necrotic grasp for at least a total of 210 years before finally releasing this remnant of humanity. The plague, the horror, would eventually return in 1341 AD and kill half the population of Europe. The Black Death would return in waves and in waves and in waves for a further 324 years before finally extinguishing. The plague left a scar on humanity like no other disease before it, and none other since. The crusade of disease against humanity had no recourse in ancient times and medieval times 
in the, the early modern period of the Renaissance. There was no cure. There was no resistance that could be offered. It was a time of tragedy on unimaginable scales. With the birth of modern medicine in the late 19th century, humanity finally overcame, had its first tools to overcome and repulse disease. With it, the Black Death faded into a distant memory, a third world problem. And it would not be long before typhus, malaria, smallpox, typhoid fever, polio, and cholera would all meet the same fate. In our next video, we'll be talking about the Black Death. Somehow, it's even crazier and more chaotic than what occurred here in Byzantium in the 540s AD. I look forward to uh, seeing you all in that, uh, in that next video. Hope this didn't bum you out too much and you found it interesting. Thank you for watching, as always.